first speaker and the second speaker, I guess, Mahabub will smoothly shift to the second speaker. That's why I'm giving a brief intro to the second speaker at the very beginning right now. She is uh, Dr. Romana Bari. Uh, the title of her talk is Detecting Stressful Social Interactions Using Wearable Psychological and Inertial Sensors. She was recently, uh, she actually has recently de defended her PhD in ECE, specializing in mobile health from the University of Memphis, Tennessee. Her dissertation is on detecting stressful social interaction using wearable psychological and industrial uh, sensors. She has published several peer-reviewed research articles in prestigious journals and conferences, including ACM EBCOM, BCB, EIA Privacy Health, all of these are very good venues. Uh, she completed her BSc in Tripoli in Buet before coming to USA. She was teaching as a lecturer in Tripoli Buet and AUST. So these are the two great speakers for today's webinar. Uh, I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Mahabub. Dr. Mahabub, please. Thank you, Professor Razi, for the introduction. This is great. This is a great opportunity for me to present our research work and, and also present what, what can be done in mobile health. So I'm starting the presentation and the title of the presentation is Mobile Health Research Towards Democratizing Healthcare. As Professor Razi explained, my PhD was also related to mobile health and I have done my PhD from University of Memphis. The lab was called M Health Systems Lab. And by name, you see the uh, mobile health is embedded in there. And the presentation that I'm going to talk today is all from my PhD life to the current position at Samsung Research. And whatever I'm presenting is nothing specific to Samsung. And the op this is my so uh, personal opinion and may not be connected with any Samsung product or Samsung future plan. So this is my own opinions to be, to be uh, clear about that. So first I'm starting with my brief biography, why I should speak about mobile health. What, are the, what is my authority to speak here? As Professor Razi explained, I have done my uh, BSc in computer science and engineering from in, uh, uh, Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology which is in short called BUET. And then in, from University of Memphis, I have done my PhD in computer science in 2016. And before that, I had experience working as an engineer in core network operation in Roby. At that time when I was working, it was called ECATEL. And after my PhD, I started my research career in industry in Nokia, Nokia Digital Health Lab as a research scientist from 2016. And then after one, more than one year, I joined Digital Health Lab at Samsung Research America. And this is also in the similar location, both of them are in Silicon Valley. And I have published papers which are already cited many times and uh, my age index is also in, on the rise. So I'm glad to uh, share those information. So now, as you have seen in the title, this is about mobile health research toward democratizing healthcare. So I, I picked this title because I was, I was scared about the healthcare resource scarcity in Bangladesh. And you can find many countries in the world, and especially in the time of COVID-19 pandemic, that healthcare is very scarce. Even in the US, as you see, the number of COVID-19 cases are rising. We, we have shortage of PPE, shortage of number of uh, healthcare professionals, number of ICU bed, ventilators, you name it, you'll find some shortage. Even in the US, which is one of the top developed country in the world, let alone Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, maybe some countries in the U uh, Africa. So those are, I mean, millions of billions of people who do, who do not have access to healthcare. And if I just focus on Bangladesh, because 
my most of my uh, audience is from Bangladesh. As you see in the in the statistics from Bangladesh, hospital number of hospitals are around five thousand. And if you imagine how many, well, how big is the population? We have hundred eighty million people living in the size of Florida or smaller than Florida, like more than half of US population living in just Florida state, so dense, but having just 5,000, around 5,000 hospitals. And out of them, some of them are government hospitals, like only 11% are government hospital and 88%, more than 88% are private hospitals. And you can imagine private hospitals are so expensive, even if hospitals are there, even I cannot afford that. If I, if I think about my family members, I cannot afford that. It's so, so expensive. And that's, that's how you see the healthcare access is not possible for many people in Bangladesh and around the world. And now from hospital to hospital bed, if we think about hospital bed, in Bangladesh, hospital bed availability is 0.08%. You can imagine for 10,000 people, if you have maybe, uh, maybe, maybe just 80, 80 hospitals, hospital bed. And if we con consider ICU bed, which is very uh, common, common vocabulary in pandemic time, COVID-19 pandemic, and ICU bed expectation is 10 is to one for each hospital. If they have 100, a regular bed, they should have 10 ICU bed. But in Bangladesh, we have 22 times less in hospital. We have less hospital, less hospital beds, and less hospital ICU bed. So how we can afford, and how we can handle this kind of pandemic? And most of the people, maybe they're scared to go to hospital. So the situation is really, really bad in, in Bangladesh and all over the world. That's why I was thinking, okay, how we can improve the situation. So one thing that I, I got is mobile phone. And if you see how many mobile phone users are in Bangladesh, although this is a poor country, but we have 165 million mobile phone users. If you combine Grameen phone, Robi, BangLaLink, Teletalk, all combined 165 million almost 100% of the population are having phone. May not, they may not have smartphone. They may have just feature phone, regular phone, but they have phone, they are connected. And we can utilize their, their connection, their device to create some kind of preliminary screening so that they can understand whether they need to go to hospital or not. At least this kind of thing can be very, very useful to reduce the burden of the healthcare system and healthcare professional. Maybe I don't, not, I don't need to go to hospital, but if I go to hospital and, and overcrowd the hospital, the people who are really in need, they may not be able to access the healthcare. And this is why I said we should use mobile technology to democratize, to reduce the, the pressure and give the access to the people who are in need of uh, the services. So this is how I, I picked the title. And as you see, why I say mobile phone, and if you think about smartphone, the, on the left side, I showed one smartphone, which is maybe one of the recent smartphone. It has numerous kinds of sensors. And you can imagine in the smartphone uh, nowadays have more computing power more, far more computing power than when I started my computer science degree in, in Buet. I, I remember it's a big machine, but very less computing power than, com, uh, than the smartphone we have at, in, in our hand, like, like this, this phone. And it has microphone, microphones, multiple microphone, camera, accelerometer, magnetometer, light sensor, pressure sensor, proximity sensor, and connectivity, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, 5G, so what else you can expect in, in this just simple one device? We can utilize that and, and make it a device that can help the user, not only just for communication, say hello, but also for 
understanding my body, understanding my health, and then I can decide whether I should go or not. Maybe you will see most of the COVID-19 patients may not need to go hospital, go to hospital. If I go, I, 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 I become panicked and I go to hospital, it does not help at all. And also on the other hand, other sensors like connected wearables, like chest band or smartwatch, as you see the smartwatch, these are also having computing power, connectivity, and the sensing capability. For example, it has accelerometer, gyroscope, magnetometer, those are motion sensor. Like if I move, it can capture. And not only that, it has PPG, which is called photoplethysmography. As, as you can see, you can, on the back of the watch and phone, there are some light sensor. It can capture our heart rate. It can capture the stress level of, of mine. Like I'm speaking, public speaking is a stressor and I can be stressed and that it can be captured by phone or the watch. A lot of sensing capability are on this, these two small devices. We can utilize that and then help the user to take a better decision. Not only that, this can be connected to healthcare system. Like clinician, maybe they have a dashboard. They can monitor thousands of patients on, a, on, on one screen so that it can become scalable. This is how we can utilize the power of mobile health and then help the humanity to handle this kind of situation or reduce the scarcity of healthcare. This is how I, I envision. I don't know whether it will be true in the, at some point, maybe not in my lifetime, but this is the vision I have. And I think many of us may have the same vision. So what is mobile health research? People who are not familiar with mobile health, I can, in layman word, I can say connected device, any connected device, portable connected device, which can have the capability of monitoring health and behavior can be considered as M health, uh, in, uh, considered in M health domain. And there are some definition by some some scholar like unimpeded um, unimpeded by geographical boundaries smartphone link wearables blah 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 a lot of a lot of things can be done but in lemon word any device even other device like this one this is called spirometer it can be connected with phone and i can do some certain certain test with this and it it is also a mobile health device by the way anyone has any question I can. I, I want to be interactive, so please feel free to ask question uh, in the in the midst of the presentation. So now I, I will be mainly focusing on the respiratory diseases. So recently, my recent research work is on respiratory diseases. As you can imagine, COVID nineteen is also a respiratory disease, but we were not familiar with this disease even uh, six months ago. Right now, we this is the pandemic. But we are mostly working, before this pandemic, we were working on asthma and COPD, which is a chronic disease. And chronic disease never cure. We only need to maintain the condition and, and live a better life, or maintain the condition and our quality of life should be improved. So we have done so many experiments with COPD and asthma. And as you see in the screen on the left side, the C when someone has a bad condition, lung condition, then their, their airways inside the lung and outside the lung, those can be inflamed. And when, when it is inflamed, the air wh wh which we are taking in, it, it does not go to the lung properly or it's not processed properly so that oxygen saturation goes down because the exchange, the gas exchange is not, not done yet. So those are the issues we also see in influenza and COVID-19. I can see some no noise, but uh, please, whoever is not, uh, not having any question, you can mute yourself. That would be useful. Thank you very much. And as you see, COPD, asthma, influenza, COVID-19, these are all respiratory diseases. And these are the third leading causes of death in the world. And if you say which one is the one, number one leading cause of death is heart disease. Heart disease is number one. Autoimmune disease like cancer is number two. Number three is the respiratory disease. 
millions of people are dying every year around the world you, you, from from this kind of diseases so our focus at this moment is on respiratory disease how we can use the smartphone or smartwatch to help the the people who are having copd or asthma so one concrete example i want to give who are not familiar with mobile health is one use case is spo2 and people at this moment they are looking for spo2 which is called pulse oximeter pulse oximeter and as you see in the in the screen in the left side is is a one pulse oximeter finger fingertip pulse oximeter we need to buy this device and then uh, attach with with our finger and then it shows pulse rate and oxygen saturation but the same thing we have on, on samsung devices people the user who has this samsung smartphone like note 4 to note note 10 they have this capability on the phone you don't need to buy the spo2 device additional you, you can do it here i can show you show how to do it i mean this is just an example that okay we can how we can help through this this kind of research like here you can see the pink light here is the is the the sensor this is the light sensor it measures the blood flow and reflection from the blood of someone and measure the measure the spo2 as you see the screen the signal this is the live signal ppg signal from me it will compute the heart rate at the same time it will compute the oxygen saturation if i am a covid 19 patient or or a copd patient i need to monitor this regularly to see how my condition is going is it worsening or is it improving it can be very useful this is just a simple example there are many many possibilities with this sensing capability and computational capability and you can easily we can easily utilize them to democratize our healthcare system or reduce the burden on the healthcare system and by the way i want to clarify one thing is that these devices or research is not going to replace our clinicians or physicians this is helping them this is to help them complement them so if we go to hospital we are already in bad condition but these devices can can monitor them beforehand even if i am not in a bad condition it can show some trend because because of the availability of the sensing capability i can measure many times a day or maybe continuously throughout the day i can monitor the ups and downs and those data is not available right now for the for the clinicians when they, we go to the clinic clinical uh, expert they say okay what are what is your symptom and what happened before sometimes we cannot report correctly as a patient we cannot explain our problem correctly but the data is an objective explanation of what happened before going to the hospital so those are so many so much useful data that ca that can be used by the clinician to take a better decision for the patient like it can be better medication it can be better uh, a better treatment overall so experience will be huge different okay now i'm moving to some of the some of the research work that we have published as uh, from samsung research america and i'm part i'm proudly part of that uh, that research work one example is the breathing rate as you see the the patient like copd patient or asthma patient or even covid 19 patient they have breathlessness they cannot breathe as we breathe they, as a healthy patient a healthy subject like <laughs> they have some breathing issue they need to breathe quickly because they are out of breath they need to breathe, breathe many times more in per minute than uh, than the uh, than the number of breaths they are doing at at their healthy healthy situation so what usually people do the, for breathe, uh, breathing rate estimation they the, the, uh, people use chest band and many other ways spirometer like like this device this bulky device they need to breathe in the in this device to to measure the respiration rate but the phone as i said it has motion sensing so 
So if it is on the chest, take one, just one minute measurement, like this regular breathing for one minute on the chest. You see the, the on the rib cage, there is a signal, this is a clean sinusoidal signal, and we can identify those peaks and apply the, uh, the, the FFT algorithm and then have the, uh, and find the dominant peak. And that can be called converted into respiration rate. It, it, it is that simple. And, and from that, so if we have one number that, like respiration rate per minute in the day or in the evening or many times, as many times as you want to measure, you have a trend. You will know whether your, your breathlessness is going up or down sim simply on the phone. And another thing that I want to highlight is our recent Kai paper. And as you, many of you may know, Kai is the top most human computer interaction conference in the world. And we have published this paper in this, uh, this year Kai. So here we are publishing, we are explaining how we can use this phone to assess wheezing. People may or may not know wheezing. In, in Bangla, in our local language, we, we, we say, I think in our, in our own uh, area, we say shai shui, like, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to generate this kind of sound from me because I don't have any issue, alhamdulillah, uh, in my lung, but people who have the issue, they have difficulty breathing, they cannot breathe well, and they, uh, because of the obstruction in the airway, they have some musical note. Ima imagine the tube from nose to, to the lung, there is a long flexible tube and the air is going in and air is go, uh, coming out. And, and if we have obstruction, the patient has obstruction, this is so much suffering. suffering. And you can see the, uh, in this graph on the top, we, this is the wheezing sound. And as you see uh, in the spectrogram, the, the frequency domain gram, uh, graph, and you can see the horizontal horizontal line, several horizontal lines, those are the dominant note or tone or, or, or musical note that can be captured using the microphone it has. When we, we hold this phone on the chest, microphone captures the sound and the, the motion sensor captures the breathing motion. When you combine them together, we can assess whether some patient has severe, uh, severe lung condition or not. As you can see, there are other graphs like cough sound cough sound and throat clearing. Those are clearly distinguishable from wheezing sound or breathing sound. And from, from that analysis, we can estimate whether the subject is in severe condition or mild severity or, or completely fine. If they are completely fine, they don't need to panic and they don't need to overcrowd the hospital. If they are in really bad condition, they should call, call their doctor and they should get higher priority. And this is how we can screen using phone using just the phone that we have in our pocket. And here, one thing I want to highlight that usually this kind of assessment is done in hospital using stethoscope. And I'm not saying this is the uh, same quality as stethoscope, and we, we, we never claim that, but this can help to, to select the people who need the stethoscope. So this is just simple, simple as that. And then another thing is cough detection. As you see, cough, <coughs> I mean, this is so violent sound. The sound, as you see in the, in the picture, the sound has, has a particular shape, particular structure that is different from other sound. For example, speaking or maybe breathing or something else. Those are different structure than, than the cough. And cough has three things. One is inhale, burst, and then voiced part. So these are the three parts, and we, we can see those, we can identify those parts, both in time domain and frequency domain. And if someone is coughing, even if you are coughing here and the watch is maybe too, uh, too it's far from your, your mouth, still the sound is so clean that it can be captured even with the watch, not, a, not, not a, a lo, a let alone the phone. And it has very uh, good sensing capability, it can also, analyze the cough and then give some assessment whether this is a dry cough or wet cough. So those are the important thing. As you see for COVID-19, wet cough is more prominent or more frequent than dry cough. So dry cough is more, more frequent than, than wet cough. So those are the things 
uh, can be generalizable not only for COPD asthma, it can be extended to other, other cases, but cough count is so important. Another is speech analysis. So as I am speaking and delivering the speech, my, my speaking rate or, or pace is different, will be different when I have some lung condition. At this moment, this is my natural regular pace. But if I, ha I have lung condition, I cannot breathe oil, I need to catch bre my breath again and again. Like, <laughs> but, I mean, if I have some issue, I cannot speak as, as I'm speaking at this moment. So those can be analyzed from speech. When I'm talking over phone with my friend or with my clinician, even the phone is only listening. The, the, the phone can analyze not only uh, sending the um, sound for communication, but also can analyze the sound and find whether I have a real bad condition. And we, we published this analysis in, in PARCOM 2020 this year. And again, anybody interested in detail, please feel free to read our papers. It has plenty of details, analysis, plus uh, validation and comparison with, with many other uh, condition and, and setup. So I would encourage anyone interested, please go and read our papers. And then another thing is mobile spirometry. And here so far I have explained the cough, the breathing, wheezing, and, and speech. Those are low effort activity. Like I'm speaking, we can be, uh, my condition, lung condition can be analyzed. Uh, I'm coughing, my lung condition can be analyzed. I'm I'm breathing, regular breathing, my lung condition can be analyzed. You, know, you don't need to do additional, the patient need, does not need additional effort to analyze those things. But mobile spirometry uh, or spirometry is another thing which is done in the hospital, which is kind of gold standard lung condition assessment in, in clinical condition. As you see in, on the top, this is the setup, which is called pulmonary function test lab. You have a big machine, like a house, and then connected computer and somebody is putting the nose clip plus inserting the tube in the mouth. And then... Sorry, any question? Okay, so somebody is blowing in the tube and then their lung condition can be measured. And this is the gold standard clinical device. But recently we have seen some device called portable spirometer, which is a smaller, simpler version, and it is connected with a, with a phone. And then we can do the same thing on this device, and, and phone can capture those, those, those things. For, let me ex, uh, show one example so that it can be clear how effort or forced breathing it needs. And then I, come, I go back to our tech, a technique that can be done only on phone. For example, <sighs> You see, this is even for for the healthy subjects. It can be it can be difficult. So this is uh, this is the portable version of of, of this uh, clinical spirometer. But we have done this thing using the phone, just the phone, because phone has microphone. We can do the same thing on the phone, like the pressure, air pressure, and sound can be analyzed to estimate the similar parameter that is done using the, uh, the, the spirometry, uh, spirometry devices. And this is the paper, got best paper, industry track best paper award in Parcom this year. The paper focus was how someone can do this at home because at home patient may have difficulty how, whether they should use this orientation, this orientation, or how close is the phone. Those are the human computer interaction related issue we need to handle. Otherwise, the technology that we develop, it will not be useful. Once we have the model and that model works well with the user and the user can easily handle it, then we can expect some success. Otherwise, no success. Even if we have great technology. That's why human computer interaction research is so connected with mobile health. And then another one is, Using, using voice sound, we can do the same thing. For example, here, 
we, I was showing the how we can forcefully breathe in into the in the phone, and then we can then we can estimate the lung function, lung capacity. But some patient may not have this luxury of forcing their breath because their condition is really bad, and and it can further aggravate or spare uh, uh, flare up their condition. So they are not supposed to do it. But here we can we can have alternative for example they can just say ah uh, and this sound if they extend it as long as possible then we can analyze the voice sound this sound and also analyze the duration as you see in the in the picture this is the top one is from this sound from one subject who has really bad condition but this is lower effort than blowing too fast too hard and and the the bottom one is from from another subject who has better health condition as you see the volume of the sound and duration of the sound is different stronger bigger longer than than the sound that we see from from severe patient this is how we can analyze and then we can estimate the lung capacity or the condition respiratory condition of someone and and this paper is published in mobile mobile sci this year it is not in the public yet so soon we'll, we are going to present this in, in mobile essay conference in, in uh, coming months. Again, so far I have shown all the opportunities. So is it only opportunity? No, there are a lot of challenges. So what are the, those challenges? There are numerous challenges. As you see, this is a, this is a multidisciplinary research effort. In, it, it involves clinician, it involves engineers, it involves scientists, it in, involves human computer interaction designer, UI UX designer. And one challenge that, that I'm highlighting here is the privacy. Because I'm talking about audio, I'm talking about accelerometer, I'm talking about health related information, lung function, heart rate, SP2. These are all my data. I, want, I don't want to share with anyone else. I want to just see and interpret myself or only my, my primary care physician, not anyone else, because many more people, they can get access to my data and do some harmful thing. So this is so much privacy concern for me. And if I'm capturing audio data, it is capturing not only my voice, it also captures voice nearby, like my, my wife's voice or maybe other family members or friends who are not part of this, this assessment. So this is not so good and how we can handle that. So one thing that we have published in BSN 2019 is the audio obfuscation. What we can do, we can keep the cough sound of the user, of the patient intact, but muffle the speech of the user and someone else. We can detect the speech and muffle them. Even if this data is captured by someone else, they cannot make sense out of it. That, that this is how this is one way to do the office um, privacy mitigation risk mitigation and, and another thing we, we are doing computing everything on the phone and then showing it to the user and then then remove the data no communication from phone phone to the server so the other can hack and then get access to the private sensitive information uh, from someone which is health related information but again this is not the only solution there can be ma many more solution and this is also not the bulletproof 100% uh, accurate solution so we we have to develop more of this technology to make the technology mobile health technology more comfortable for the for the patient so that they feel more uh, they, they feel energized motivated to use the device otherwise technology will not be any use for, for patient. Another challenge is generalizability. As you may have heard many times, my signal is noise to you, your signal is noise for me. How we can generalize? And sometimes we have 100% accuracy detecting something in lab condition, which is controlled condition. But when we deploy this model in field, there are so many noise we cannot handle. In that case, how, how it can be generalizable? So there are plenty of challenges from one person to another person generalizability from one setup to another setup the generalizability so those are uh, 
still open problem and we we have some handle on that for example you can feed the features or or things that that are more generalizable from field lab to field this is just one example i am showing we published one paper in ubicom 2018 which was showing okay if we detect conversation in lab how we can generalize this conversation detection in field when we have so many other noises how we can handle that so i encourage you to read this paper that portion of the paper um, and to get more information but there are plenty of challenges some of them are handling some way in some way maybe other there are other better ways to do the same thing okay i think this is uh, almost the uh, end of end of my presentation i'm i want to emphasize that mobile health research creates tremendous opportunity to make the healthcare accessible to many people with low cost and also it it can be easily scalable one clinician can easily monitor maybe multiple multiple or many more patient at the same time on on the single clin uh, clinician dashboard and the thing is it's not going to replace the uh, the, uh, the clinician it is going to help them to take a better decision to save more life improve quality of life and and also gives the power to the to the user to handle their their situation and decide better uh, take a better decision for themselves so these are the things that i have presented i can take questions later but again i have presented so far is very high level overview let's hear from rumana she will be presenting about the stress detection mental psychosocial stress from someone using the physiological sensors and we can see how this kind of study or experiment is designed and how we use machine learning and signal processing and statistical analysis to to sanitize the sensor data the the mobile sensor data and then develop the model and then give the output that oh am i stressed or not so those kind of output maybe so far i i, I gave you breadth she can give the depth of one particular example of stress detection with that i i i invite rumana to speak on our presentation Uh, thank you, Dr. Mahbub Rahman. Uh, I request Professor Alim to introduce uh, Prof. Dr. Roman again a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, thanks to Dr. Mahbub for the excellent presentation. And now the second speaker, as I have already introduced, try to introduce at the very beginning. She is uh, Dr. Romana Bari. And the title of her talk would be Detecting stress Stressful Social Interactions Using Variable Psychological and uh, Inertial Sensors. Uh, just to have the intro very briefly, she has recently defended her PhD in uh, ECE uh, in University of Memphis. And she has also published a number of very good papers in good venues. Uh, she completed her BSc in Tripoli in Buet and before coming to USA. She was teaching as a lecturer in Tripoli, Buet and AUST. I would like to request uh, Dr. Uh, Romana to please start her speech, please. Are you waiting for me? Yeah, I think uh, uh, I, can, I couldn't hear the Pauline's voice. I'm waiting. waiting. Professor Razi, are you introducing A? Uh, uh, Dr. Romana, you can start. Please. Maybe he's on mute. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can start my presentation. Hi, this is Romana Bari. I just recently graduated from University of Memphis and I completed my PhD. Uh, my background is I completed my bachelor's and master's from Buet. And then I came here to pursue my PhD in the University of Memphis. And my specialization is mobile health. So, uh, so Dr. Rahman has introduced uh, the mobile health in general. So I will give a specific example. How can we utilize this uh, to you know, monitor health and behavior in our daily life? So the, the 
my dissertation topic or today's presentation is about detecting stressful social interaction using wearable physiological and inertial sensor. And this is the list of publication that we, I have published in top tier peer reviewed journals. And uh, these are uh, very prestigious and it took us hard work to publish in these uh, pair journals. So first I would like to discuss what is stress. We are all familiar with the stress in our daily life. So stress can happen uh, from any domain, like it can arise from our academic pressure, like we have deadlines or we have exam, or it can appear from the work deadlines. So sometimes stress can appear from the financial difficulties that we face in our day-to-day -day life, or we if we have health condition, we can be stressed from that. So there are so many reasons of stress in our life it can be small reason it can be big reason so and another thing is just it can happen at any time it it, it doesn't maintain any time protocol like uh, stress will happen at in the morning it can happen during lunch time or the, at the evening when we go home and the road is uh, heavily blocked by traf traffic and we get stress due to this uh, heavy traffic in the, in the road so oh, if we are aware of our stress level and these stress categories, we can better maintain the stress level in our life. Otherwise, if stress become chronic, it can have severe consequences in our life in future. And researchers have been researching this stress for decades and they have categorized the stress events that we face in our day-to-day -day life in some broad categories. So first one is the interpersonal stress. What is that? We interact with so many people in our life. Like we interact with our parents, with our brothers, sisters, with our friends, with our romantic partners or partners. So when we talk with them, sometimes this conversation becomes stressful. And this is in the, we categorize in the interpersonal stress. And the second highest stressor is the work related stress. And work-related stress, can we have some deadlines or a severe pressure at work? And third stressor is in our life is home-related stress that we face when uh, to maintain our home, that we have so many work to do in a short interval of time. And the fourth uh, uh, stress reason in our life is financial difficulties. And the fifth reason is the health-related difficulties. So there are so many reasons of stress, but in my job, presentation, I will be focusing on the first stressor, that is the interpersonal stress, the stress that we are, that we face when we talk with the other people in our daily life. So what, what is the advantage of if we monitor the stressful interactions? So we know that if negative in emotions tend to escalate the conflict, and if we can able to identify that our negative, we are feeling ne emotions negatively, we can able to control our emotion and that can better lead to a better conversation. And wearable devices like smartphones, smartwatches have capabilities to monitor this stress level. And they can, if we are aware of a stress level, these devices can help us uh, to give some prompt that, okay, now your stress level is rising, please do something to take a break or de-stress. So we can just post the conversation and maybe drink some water or take a break and or divert the conversation so that we we don't we don't escalate that conflict anymore. And researchers have developed several intervention techniques. So what is intervention? Intervention is a way so that when a the conversation or a conflict is going, we can intervene or we can try to stop that and we can uh, distract that conversation by uh, prompting a message in our uh, wristwatch or a mobile phone or so that uh, we can our okay, our stress level is rising. Uh, we need to stop it or we need to divert the conversation. And there are several ways of intervention, such as deep breathing, like we can take a deep breath, and, but this requires some active attention from the uh, user. However, there is uh, now researchers have de developed several mindless intervention. Like if we can give some feedback on the heart, uh, smartwatch, like a 
has slower heartbeat, it shows that our stress level decreases. So for that, what is our vision? So our vision is to use, easy to use sensing technology to passively and continuously monitor the stressful interaction. So we need to identify the stressful interaction first. And if we know the timing of the stressful interaction, then we can intervene at that moment using smartphone or smartwatches and so that we can have a better conversation or better manage our stress level. How can we detect this stressful interaction? There has been a lot of research done to detect these stressful interactions, mainly the interaction. So first one is the acoustic sensing, the audio-based technology. There, uh, people have, researchers have used audio for decades to understand whether somebody is involved in an interaction because we know that uh, mobile, phone has, mobile phone has the capability to record the audio. However, this raises privacy concern. We don't want our voice to be recorded all the time and be analyzed. We don't like it because it, it, it is not very comfortable. However, the physiological signal, such our, our bio signal like ECG, respiration, they have some properties that can distinguish whether a conversation or an interaction is stressful or not. We are maybe aware of this ECG signal. We, our uh, doctors sometimes use it to, uh, to look out for our health condition, like whether we have arrhythmias or not. It is a bit-to-bit -bit interval. And this ECG signal and the breathing signal that we inhale and exhale, this can be used to monitor the stress. And if we know whether somebody is involved in an interaction in that moment, we can identify those stressful interaction. And these uh, signals can be captured using our smartwatches and other wearable devices. In this slide, I will discuss how can we detect the stress from our, in our regular life, in daily life. And in, in this case, we have used a chest wound sensor and it is worn around the chest and it can capture the, uh, the ECG. We, then, uh, we need to attach electrodes with our chest that can capture the ECG signal. And we wear a, a chest bell around our uh, chest that measure the, uh, when we breathe in or breathe out, our uh, chest expands or shrinks. So if we track that movement, that gives the breathing signal. And this breathing signal has some proper, uh, and uh, in this uh, slide, if you see on the left, this is top one is the breathing signal and the bottom one is the ECG. We have, uh, we have measured several characteristics from these signals and that is fed to a, a machine learning model. So what does this model do? It's like a black box. And if we give two classes of data, like one class is the stressful interaction data and another is non-stress data. So this uh, model will able to identify some patterns from those two classes and it will give an output of stress likelihood. Like what is the current level of stress? What is the probability of stress at this moment for me if we uh, can wear these devices? So if we wear the device for the whole day during our awake hours, we can have a, a probability of stress for the whole day so that we can understand, okay, uh, at 10 a.m. I was stressed, what happened? We can remember, maybe I was uh, sitting in an exam room and I had an exam at that time and that created stress at that moment. So we can understand ourselves and the reason of stress. Now, the first challenge is that the, uh, to develop, I said, we need to develop a, a machine learning model. And uh, the input of the model is two classes of data. So we need to give a class that, uh, that, stress, uh, that contains the stress data, like stressful interaction, what is the physiology you know, during that moment, and another class of data when we are normal, we are not stressed. And so that the machine learning can uh, uh, learn that what are the basic uh, significant properties that arise when somebody is stressed. And for that, we need some ground truth or the labels of this data. And the, the uh, most uh, researchers have used mostly the diary-based method or interview-based method to capture those stress moments. So what is that? 
suppose we have a diary and I, I, I need to remember when I was stressed and it's sometimes hard to remember, okay, uh, I, I was stressed at, at noon because I was having lunch with my uh, friends and so this uh, a nice conversation is turned into a stressful conversation. Uh, but sometimes we forget that and the precise timing of the stress moment is hard to find because uh, when it starts and when it ends, sometimes we don't know, but our physiology reacts to that situation. And if we can use that information uh, to label that start and end time of the stress event, and if we have a better level, the machine learning will learn more accurately. And in future, we can use this or deploy this model to, uh, uh, to identify the stress level uh, with uh, some unknown data. In this work, we have developed a day reconstruction based visualization system and this, uh, this method give cues to the participant or user uh, what happens during the whole day. So it's a visualization and it is uh, uh, the, uh, the data that we have collected using these wearable devices. It is plotted against the x-axis. And if you look at the y-axis, it gives some inferences, like what is the location at different time of point? And what is my conversation status? What is the stress likelihood? What is the activity? And these channels of information are measured using respiration or accelerometer or GPS data. For example, if you see in this picture, suppose uh, this uh, fourth channel is showing the stress likelihood. And at 12 p.m., I saw that my stress level, the yellow color is showing that I am, my stress level is uh, relatively higher compared to baseline. The green means no stress. Yellow means moderate level of stress. And if it is become red, that means I am feeling high arousal, highly stressed. And if we know that, okay, uh, let's speak at 12 p.m. and the stress likelihood is showing that I'm a little bit stressed. And what, what is the reason of stress if we ask? So we look at this visualization and it shows that I was at the restaurant and I was in, uh, if we can zoom in, see that I was involved in a conversation and my activity level was low. So I, it will help us to identify and remember what was the reason of stress so that we can have a better precision and labeling of the stress event. And also if we look at this uh, non-stress part, we can see, okay, today's work was not that stress. 50% of the time we, I was stressed at work and not stressed the remaining part of the day. And at home, I have some frequent stress uh, event, but mostly I was, very, I was having no stress at home. So it gives some understanding of the whole day of my stress event. So if somebody is a, a stress, is normally is prone to stress, and he have several stress events throughout the whole day, maybe it will help him to understand that, okay, what can I do to improve this condition? And he can better manage his stress level. So now we have used this visualization system to annotate or label the data when we are having stressful interactions or conversation or non-stress conversations. And I showed that we have several channels of information, like what is the location? What is the activity status? What is the conversation status? And these inferences are done using separate machine learning models. So first one is the location inference. And we used a map-based visualization system. And we uh, give user to mark that point, okay, what was that location? So we have collected that GPS from the phone and that GPS can be converted into location clusters. Okay, this is my home location. I spent this amount of time. And this circle means the color of the circle is showing the level of stress. So if it is green, that means the time I spent at home is mostly non-stress time. And the, if we look at the work for this participant, for this particular day, the work was really stressful. And it is, this is indicated by the color. So this visualization helps user to mark those location. Okay, what is my home work or am I in a restaurant or am I uh, stuck in a traffic? And also it is showing that what is my stress level. And to detect conversation, we can, I said, we can use uh, the audio signal, but it is really privacy uh, sensitive. 
That's why we try to use a bias signal that is our breathing signal. So we, when we don't, we, are, uh, we don't speak, we, uh, the inhalation and the exhalation is pretty rhythmic. The uh, duration and the velocity of infer, inspiration is equivalent to that of exhalation. But when we speak, we take quick inhalation and then we exhale slowly in accordance with the speech flow. So it gives the speech breathing a sawtooth profile, an asymmetrical profile. And these characteristics can be uh, extracted by machine learning model to say if we have a breathing time series for the whole time, whole day, if we look at the bottom picture, we have a breathing uh, signal. And if we, machine learning model see a sawtooth shape, it will label it as, oh, this person is involved in a conversation. And when we see some rhythmic pattern and, and it can detect that, okay, it's, it's, he is not in a conversation right now. So this is the purpose of this machine learning model that it extracts a significant amount of information so from those hidden data. And to uh, detect the activity, we have used accelerometer. We, we, uh, some of us will be aware of the step count that we, how many steps we take, 10,000 steps. We, sometimes we have a target. So what they use, they use the accelerometer. So when we don't move, the signal variation in the accelerometer signal is very low. But when we move, the variation is high. So if we can capture this low and high variation, this machine learning model can say, okay, you are now in an active state or no, you are not moving at all. So these information are used to know the status of a user, whether he is active or not, whether he is involved in a conversation or not, what is his stress level or not, and what is his location. Now we have designed the visualization. Now we real need some real life data. Okay, we need some stressful interaction data. And for that, we have recruited romantic couples. The purpose of recruiting romantic couples is that we can maximize the number of interaction because we know partner is the one we spent most of our time, at least more than 50% of our time we spent with our partner, maybe at home or outside. And other time we spent in office or in university or in groceries or outside work. So we re that's why we recruited couples. And both of the partners came to the lab and they wore this chest band they had this wrist smart watch and they carried a smartphone. And thus we can have uh, their bias signals, respiration, ECG and accelerometer, and also the GPS from the smartphone. And this uh, signal was used to uh, measure their conversation, stress, activation, location status. And they were shown a sample visualization. Look, you are going to collect this data and this data can be used to for generate this kind of visualization. And this visualization will help you to understand the stress level or what is the stress condition, what is the stress factor in your life so that they better understand what they are going to do in the field. And they were shown how to wear these devices and they go out for a data collection. So after the data collection period, they came back and we processed their data and we generated a visualization with their own data and we showed them, okay, now it is your data and this is the stress arousal. So when we see a stress event detected by the visualization, we ask them, what is the reason of your stress? What's going on? Who were with you? And they, they gave several answers. Okay, I was stressed due to this reason. I was uh, involved in a traffic, something like that. So this slide shows their interview results. So they've said that uh, among, we found 100 stress events and 50% of, uh, of them is due to interaction related stress. So interaction uh, happened with the partner, friends, colleagues, or supervisor. And rest of the uh, stress event was either due to commute or work. So commute was the second high stress that we found in our data set. And because they're stuck in a in jam, you know, it's, a, it's not a pleasant uh, experience when we uh, were stuck in a jam. And a third event is the work related stress. And uh, the work-related stress included deadlines, answering work-related emails or text. And this is the distribution of what uh, the stress event throughout the whole day. We see that uh, the interaction-related stress 
appeared throughout the whole day, but work related, commute related stress mostly appeared in the morning and in the evening. And it is also uh, uh, matched with the numbers that we found in the literature. In the literature, they said most of our stress, you know, stress is happening due to interaction. Now I will show, uh, show some example that how our physiology varies uh, or the stress dynamics looks like. So these are two examples from our participants that they were involved in a conflict with their romantic partner. And this is the probability of stress at that moment. So we saw that the, well, this is partner one and this is partner two. The two, two color is showing two partner. And for the purple color is showing the, the probability is like one. She, she or he was highly stressed at that moment. And in the second figure, it shows that both of them were aroused, but they were not uh, maybe aware of the stress arousal that was happening. But when we show the visualization, this creates a really, okay, if my stress arousal is that high, it, it, can be, it can become chronic. So we need to do something to manage the stress level. And this is a uh, stress arousal during commute. And we saw that during commute, we see higher likelihood of stress, but the frequency is very low. If we compare the previous picture with this one, so we see some cyclical pattern in this conflict and it is more frequent. The, the, we, we are seeing high arousal when we are involved in a conflict with partner or friends or uh, supervisor. Now we have the stress likelihood, the probability of stress, and we have the label. Okay, uh, this is the characteristics of our stress likelihood when we are uh, involved in a stressful interaction or when we uh, are stressed due to work or when we are stuck in a commute. So uh, we, if we know the stress likelihood pattern and the labels, now we, uh, we define several feature or characteristics from the stress likelihood and feed it into the machine learning model. And we saw that in our case, we, able, we were able to find whether a stress arousal due to stressful interaction or commute with an F1 score of seven. So it is a metric that gives what it's, whether it's a good accuracy or not in a scale of one. And we also saw that if uh, we, we move our hands uh, uh, differently when we are involved in different stressful situation. So when we are involved in a stressful interaction, we tend to move our hand more compared to when we drive or when we work. Because those uh, during driving, our hand is mostly guided by the driving wheel. Or when we work, maybe we are typing in a laptop. So those are more guided uh, motion, but we are stressed that can be detected by from the uh, bias signal. I, and this uh, using this wrist motion and we append it or augment it with our bias signal feature and we can able to improve the module accuracy. Now I will show the implication of my work. So uh, this is a stress likelihood during a stressful interaction. And these are stress cycle, a high stress arousal. And this is the start point of a the stressful interaction. And we show that uh, after first cycle, that on average, the, we show the distribution here, on average, a cycle lasts four minutes. So after four minutes of a, an interaction started, we can able to distinguish, okay, this stress is, uh, is due to an interaction. And we can, if we know the reason, we can design an intervention technique, okay. Like we, I can uh, give a mobile prompt or I can just give a vibration in my wristwatch. Okay, now you are having a stressful interaction and you, maybe it's time to take a break. And we can able to detect uh, with that with an F F1 score of 0.7. And however, if we see more cycle, our model performs better. That, so there are some inaccuracies. But if we see more cycles, we see the machine learning model sees more feature and it can more accurately detect what is the stress condition at this moment. And after second cycle, uh, in, it takes almost 10 minutes and we can able to intervene. So that, that is a de design choice, whether we want more accuracy or we want to be intervened earlier. So if we want more accuracy, like we don't, 
we want to be sure that we are actually involved in a stressful moment. So if we want to be sure, we can wait until the end of the session and it takes almost 20 minutes. But we are sure, but the drawback is the whole stress event is already completed. But if we want to be intervened early uh, so that we can better manage our stress and better manage our conversation, so we want to be uh, intervened early. So that is the main, my, uh, uh, that was my presentation. So this stressful interaction model can enable reflection of our stray, daily stress event and it can, we can design a intervention technique in terms of timing and what we do the content. And also in future, if this work can be expanded, we can use more data-driven feature or we use complex model like the deep learning models. We are all aware of deep learning. It's, there is a hype of deep learning at this stage. So we can use this model to better uh, uh, detect these uh, stressful moments. Thank you. And if you have any question, I'd like to, I would be happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Alim. Uh, please uh, handle questions. So if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or type the question. Already we have a few questions. So, uh, and the questions uh, will be for both of you. So whoever Professor feels- Ali, should, should we move to the question and answer session? Yes, yes. Yeah, so Dr. Mahbub, you can see a couple of questions to you. Dr. Mahbub. Yes. Yeah, so there are a couple of questions to you. You can see that in the chat or I, I, I can just read, read those out, no problem. And if I'm not wrong, there is also another question. Another question to uh, Dr. Romana. Yes. So the first first couple of questions that is from uh, Mohammed Kaviru Jaman. Uh, first, he thank you for the excellent presentation, Dr. Mahbub. And then uh, the first question from him is, we know electromagnetic or EM radiation is harmful for health even though we cannot imagine without mobile or EM radiation, how this issue is considered in those mobiles or other devices? This is the first question. And the second question to again, Dr. Mahabu, would you please tell again the method by which the outside noise is mitigated and privacy is secured in those devices? So I guess you have got those questions, right? Yeah, thank you very much, Professor Raji. Um, this is a really interesting question. Thank you for, uh, thank you everyone for listening and uh, having those thoughtful questions. And I would say from electromagnetic mediation, I'm not expert in that area. So it may not be justified to speak anything, but overall I would say the phone is already part of our life. So we are using it for our communication. So our goal is to utilize the same thing without addi adding additional risk of additional of say, radiation so can we help user further as you see this is kind of utility and and risk mitigation uh, i mean trade off between utility and risk so if we use the phone for communication radiation is there so if we we are already exposed so if we add more value to it then then the utility of ex exposing to radiation may be better this is my uh, explanation it's not exactly the the how how intense is the risk is with uh, electromagnetic mediation uh, radiation i do, i don't have expertise on commenting on that and then the, the second question about the uh, uh, the noise thing the noise as you see when you talk about the audio acoustic signal there will be a lot of noise right so how do we handle if we have coughed for example cough data so cough is a particular signal. There can be similar other um, cough-like sound. So we can identify cough-like sound, like maybe dog barking or do knocking the door. Those, those, th those things we consider as a negative class. Again, uh, it is in work in progress how we can handle numerous noise in the, uh, in, in the environment to, to be more accurate, to use false positive detection for cough and, and other things. So this is one. Uh, another question was, um, oh, how, how we reduce the privacy risk, right? So one example I have shown reducing privacy risk is to obfuscate the, obfuscate the speech. When we collect the audio, we, we don't 
we don't say this is um, this is supposed to collect the private speech. So for example, cough detection from sound. So we are interested in cough, not in speech. In that case, the cough sound can be it can be uh, can be intact, whereas the other sound, including speech, can be obfuscated, muffled. This is how we we have handled. Maybe th this is called obfuscation. There can be many other techniques, for example, substitution, deletion, suppression. So many more techniques are out there in the literature and, and those can be tested. But for us, we did obfuscation technique. It did really good. Uh, it, at least in, in our experiment, we have seen it is working. So those are the things that we have uh, done to handle the risk, privacy risk, and, and also, also the, the noise. Thank you for the question. Do you want to take the question on, yeah. on, the, stress. on the stress? Yeah. So, okay. Keep that. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? So, yes. for the stress uh, detection model, we need uh, that's a very good question, actually. We need uh, some ground truth data for uh, to develop that stress model. And for that, it's hard to capture those stress even in the field. And that's why we, while we developed this test model, we collected data in the lab environment with a strict protocol. And our participant uh, took part in a public speaking and also that is a mental stress. And that is the, like related to work-related stress. And they also took part in arithmetic tasks, our participants. And third, they took part in a core pressure test. That is a physical stress. And in the core pressure, uh, uh, task uh, the users you know, dip their hand in a certain cold uh, certain, uh, in a cold water so we have their physiological arousal during those three tasks and and that data was used to learn the machine learning model and with though we have developed the model using the lab data and we applied it on the field and we see good results using that data like 80 to 90 percent accuracy in detecting stress arousal and the second question is, which simulation tool have you used for simulating your model? So I have used uh, both MATLAB and Python to develop my model. And I will encourage you to use Python because they are now they, are, they have really good libraries and, uh, and also the industry is moving towards Python. So it's better to use Python at this stage like this, to develop the model, to process the data, and everything. I guess uh, there appear yet another question. Yeah. And that is, is it possible to do all the measurements in phones other than Samsung? Our people usually use low-cost phone. That's the question. Oh, thank you. Uh, this is a good question. Right now, our experiment obviously will be focused to Samsung phones and Samsung capabilities. This is our project to show the, the sensing capability that, that we have uh, is good enough to do those activities. For others, I, I'm saying if other, other phone has sense, sensing capability similar to us, it should generalize to, to those, those things. There can be challenges from device one device to another device. So those need to be mitigated, but in general, it should work with others. But with low cost phone, even if it has accelerometer and microphone, it should work. And I can, I can give an example of the low cost phone. For example, <clears throat> the mo mobile spirometry, uh, as I showed that we are blowing on the phone and we can, we can process everything on the phone, which is a Samsung, maybe high end phone, expensive phone. But from University of Washington, one group showed that even with the feature phone, the low cost phone, if someone generate the call and then do the same thing on the phone, like blowing. So microphone, even if we have low cost phone, micro, uh, microphone is there. So the microphone can capture that sound it, and it, send, it can send to the, to the server side like a phone communication by by which we we send uh, it send our speech to to the recipient it can be similarly it can, the, this sound interesting sound can be sent to the server side and then analyzed on the server side so this is the kind of trade off if if you do not have the expensive phone to process on the on the phone then it can be done on the server side 
even using with the with the lower cost phone. Does it answer the question? Okay, great. I think so. And there is yet another question. First of all, Sam Sadrajib, uh, he actually congratulated you, Dr. Mahabu, for the okay. work. And then uh, he told, uh, I, I'm just quoting, you have talked about pulmonary functionality test, which is based on lung air volume. That means we will always need some sort of device attached to mobile. You analyzed voice and correlated with lung volume. My question is, how much accuracy could be achieved? Do you think it is possible to have a professional solution in near future which can detect F1 or FVC ratio and warn about early COPD detection? And that's a very, very good question and very specific to see a uh, lung function test. <clears throat> so one thing I would say, air volume. We, we, I mean, one thing we, we, I need to clarify, I, we don't need additional device to be attached with the phone. So this is uh, just microphone, which is already part or embedded on the phone. So we don't need additional thing. This is one. Another thing is the FEV1, FEC ratio that, that we have presented or published so far it was around 95% accurate. So I don't know whether this is still uh, high accuracy in terms, of, in terms of clinical assessment. So this, that's why we are working with our clinicians. We work with Harvard Medical School. There are a lot of world renowned professors and pulmonologists we are working with and verifying our algorithm, whether it makes sense to uh, use it as an early detection. So we, we are not there yet, but in future, I hope it will be useful um, for early detection. And as, as you have mentioned, FEV1 FVC ratio is relatively easier uh, or more accurate estimation, but FEV1 volume, FVC volume, those are, those are challenging with just with the phone, but we are still working on it to, to make it more accurate. Thank you. Okay, great. So any more question? And for the participants, please feel free to raise hand. Yeah. Professor Alim, there is a question from uh, Kausar. The uh, uh, question is about, uh, uh, my question is that, uh, is the stressful data publicly available? Would you please share the link from where we can collect the data and pursue the research related stress? It's for uh, Dr. Romana. Thank you, Kausar. Uh, the thing is we collect our own data in our lab and we develop those models. We have some data available publicly, and we have a, 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 we have those data in md2k.organization. Please email me uh, so that I can give you some uh, uh, I can give you some link of the data. I don't I don't know what uh, specific data set is available for public, but I, I can explore. So there are some data that is available. And I need to just check whether st particularly stress stream of data is available for a public use. Because we collect so many data, so many streams of data. So please email me uh, so that I can uh, continue our conversation uh, through the email. Okay, great. And I, so I can give another... you my email here. And there is another question for you from uh, Hasana. It's... Yeah, that is, is there any security measurement considered for protecting users' stress data? To Dr. Romana, please. So at this moment, we just collect uh, the data and we run the stress model to find the stress measurement. And this is, we are, either researchers are using that stress data or we are giving that data to that particular user. We haven't shared it with anybody else. That's why we haven't, uh, obfuscate the data set data yet, but I think I haven't seen any research so far that obfuscated uh, the stress data. Maybe it can be a good feature research, I think. We can, may, uh, we can do it in future, but at this moment, we haven't used any security measure to protect the identity or to protect the stress data. Great, Rajiv Ahmed, can you please have your question? You have raised your hand. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Mahabub. Uh, 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 so my question is, uh, so I think uh, you already show like so many results related to the speech. 
So is there any possibility so you can make a, like a different shit, like a different speech and like a, uh, like a different sensor? There is uh, like a one major concern, uh, like a specificity. Like a, if you go like a COVID or the Mars or SARS, like a, they have a, like a different uh, even, uh, both of all of them are like, uh, it is like a breathing problem, but uh, maybe they are, uh, maybe they are, maybe they are the frequency spectrum. That means the power spectrum, maybe the similar. So is there any possibility like uh, how uh, you guys can handle this problem? Like uh, are there, like they are, if they are related, uh, even for uh, like a patient to patient, uh, it can be the similar because uh, uh, so is, so how your algorithm are efficient to uh, classify or differentiate uh, this kind of problem, like a specificity? Yeah, I think this is a very interesting question. Specificity is, is an, an issue for many problems, including, for example, cough. We can have a lot of false positive, which can affect specificity. This is, this is well said. And for that, we can use multimodal fusion sensor, not only just audio, maybe something, some other, for example, accelerometer to make it more specific to the, uh, to the, to the, to the patient. And regarding the COVID and others, uh, I, I need to clarify that I did not work with COVID patient directly um, so far. So I, I cannot com uh, comment on, on that. So far, I have worked with COPD and asthma and we, our team is working on that. And we are handling multimodal fusion. And, and also this is a work in progress. We are publishing papers and and filing patents, um, as you see, this is kind of relatively open field. Thank so you. So even for the asthma, suppose uh, for the one patient, for, for the same patient, uh, maybe they are like a power spectrum. It can be different because it's uh, depend on the speech. So like the time to time, our speech, we speak at uh, differently. So how you think like uh, based on the speech, uh, we can differentiate the disease and how specific they are. Yeah, yeah. That's a, again. I would say for, from only from speech, accuracy is not that high. If, if you read our paper, I would encourage you to read the paper. The accuracy is not that that high compared to the mobile spirometry or compared to the blowing, the mobile spirometry compared to cough, because those are cleaner signal and and it it varies. And and again, it does not mean that we can do this with any speech. We can select the speech that are more representative to assess lung condition. So those are also interesting uh, research question that we need to handle. It's, it's not, it, it may not work with all the speech, even if it is from the same subject. Does it answer? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your nice question. answer. Oh, thank, you. thank you. So the next question is from Mohammad Aminul Haq Choudhury. First of all, he thanked both of you for the excellent presentations. Then uh, he placed his question to Dr. Mahabub. The question is, is it possible to detect early signs of pulmonary diseases using such techniques? Like there may be subtle change in our breathing or other signal before they before the clear symptoms develop. Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I don't have direct answer at this moment, but I hope in future I can answer this, this question. Thank you. Okay, great. So any more question? So at last, I guess I have got a chance to have some questions. Oh, Wait. okay, you ask. <laughs> so the first thing that came to my mind, uh, you actually showed how you have placed the smartphone, right, Dr. Mahabu? You have placed the smartphone on the chest. Uh -huh. If I'm not wrong, the placement itself have some sort of sensitivity, and if it is not rightly placed, the answer might be distorted. So, do you need any physician for the placement? If it is so then the ubiquitousness that is gone. Because I, if, if I need some expert is to place the smartphone on my chest. So how the technique is uh, sensitive to the placement of the smartphone? Yes, this is, this is again the human, inter, human computer interaction questions. As, as I emphasized many, many times in my presentation, if we cannot make, we can, our algorithm cannot handle this kind of interaction, then it, uh, the technique will not be useful, right? So if I place it on the left side or the right side, if I cannot handle this, then people may not be may not be able to follow. There are two things, uh, Professor Razi. One thing is, so technology should be easy to use, right? So if it is left or right, it sh 
it should not be any issue. And, uh, and, and there can be another UI UX because we have a screen, big screen that can guide, uh, guide the user how to do it. So what we have done with that we have, we have user interaction UI UX design to guide the user where to place with some visuals and instructions so that they can, we can help them to, to place it correctly. And even if they don't place, uh, place it correctly on the, on the test position, our algorithm can detect and give the further input. For example, okay, so I, I, I put it here. This is not chest, right? So this is my arm and it should not supposed to capture my breathing, right? If someone do it and it can detect those, those positioning and then it, it can vibrate, the phone can vibrate and interact and say that, oh, your, your placement is not correct. Can you do it again with your chest, either right, right or left? So this is how we can, the, the technology can be more interactive uh, and and uh, guide the user to do it correctly. Professor Razi, does it, does it answer your uh, question? Thank you so much. The guiding thing, that, that's the key yeah. point. Thank you so much. So there are two question. questions. Yeah. Okay. Please. Yeah. Another question from the audience. First of all, uh, thanks for arranging it. And then uh, sensors, those are attached with a smart a smartphone. Sometimes measure data with low accuracy. This may mislead an individual and treatment procedure. What are you thinking about it? Okay, again, this is an excellent question. As, as, I, as I said, it, it is with the patient. They can measure it multiple times, anytime. It, it does not cost additional money, right? So if we have low accuracy with the sensing, our algorithm can detect those, those conditions and then guide the user to do it again. If it fails, do it again. And again, the breathing, breathing changes, it does not change every minute. It can change maybe in the morning or in the afternoon or in several hours. So we can aggregate the results, multiple results within that time frame, and then get a better accuracy. As you see, majority voting and many other techniques that, that can help to make the inference more robust. So this is how we can improve the accuracy, even if the sensor um, sometimes does not, I mean, sensor works, but measurement may not be, may not be correct all the time, but it's still possible to handle it. Okay, great. So I guess that there is a question from uh, Facebook and uh, Professor uh, okay. Ansar, please okay. read that. Yes, thank you. So the question is from uh, Shariful Islam. Uh, mm -hmm. He asked this question to Dr. Mahbub during your presentation time that, are you using any AI or machine learning approaches? So you have, uh, I mean, multiple projects you mentioned, so you can give an overall, uh, I mean, ideas on this point. That okay. what are the different machine learning or AI modules you have been exploring? Yeah. Right, this is, this is based on machine learning. As, as you see, this is application of machine learning. It's not developing new machine learning technique. For example, the blowing, example that I showed, that sound is captured. This is raw data. We need to process using signal processing technique and then sanitize the data. Once we know the, the blowing quality, quality of the data is, is really good. And then we apply a regression model, we extract the features from the audio and from the motion. And then feature can be MFCC. It can be zero crossing rate in time domain and frequency domain, those features. And then using the feature, selec feature selection um, a method, we, we select the features, those are more correlated with the target variable. In this case, target variable is the FEV on FVC ratio, which is the lung, lung uh, biomarker. And, and then we use regression model to predict the FEV on FVC ratio. This is how we are using machine learning techniques and statistical techniques to, uh, to, to predict those numbers and assess the, the condition. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, oh. oh, there is a question from Arafat. Yeah, mm -hmm. so the question is, in real life, there may be class imbalance between stressful and non-stressful data. Like the duration of stressful data may be much bigger, much bigger than non-stressful data. What can be some good methods to tackle this problem that, that's related to balance of data over stressful and non-stressful events, I guess. Dr. Romana, please. I think that's a very good question and it is a very 
a common thing that we face in our day in when we develop a machine learning model and we can address it in several ways first one is collect, collection of more data like which where whichever class is imbalanced we collect more data but it may not be feasible all the time so sometimes we already have collected the data and we see some class imbalance what we can do so we can what we do there we can do two things first one is we can resample the lower the low number of classes so that we have the the distribution resembles with the real life distribution so we can resample the the class that has lower frequency and so that we can make it uh, balance and another thing is uh, though we have imbalanced class set uh, in the uh, after detecting uh, after applying it with the machine learning model well, we can use several uh, metric to measure the performance of the model maybe accuracy is not a good measure at this moment because the accuracy just uh, tries to measure uh, if the one class is uh, the, is more then it will uh, and that is uh, accurately detected the accuracy will be high but we can use other metrics like f1 score or precision recall to have a better understanding irrespective of the class in uh, irrespective of the class balance so maybe we can resample the data or we can use other metric to see the performance of the model Wait. So, Professor Ahad, sir, any question from Facebook? Uh, so far, no more, but okay. I have many questions, basically. Please, please, so, please feel free to go. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, some of the questions are like, for example, uh, to uh, Mahbub Bhai, that uh, now when you mentioned that uh, with the sensing, you place the phone in some locations, but we know that uh, when we move, uh, we keep the mobile phone in different locations, like uh, on the pockets or other places, and sensors orientation at the, and as well as position, uh, we get different kinds of features and they vary a lot. Uh, would you please uh, point on this issue that how do you deal this kind of things when you need uh, data from a specific location, but we cannot keep the mobile phone or sensors over there, please. Yeah, nice question. I think this is also related to the human computer interaction part, right? So as as, it, as I said, this is the placement for breathing monitoring. The maybe left side is better, or left side, right side, whatever. But and and this this thing is kind of active task. Active task means that we expect the user to do it one minute for when they are sitting, or maybe in stationary position. I know they can put the phone on the pocket or somewhere else but we don't measure at the time because it, it does not give us credible data so this is one we need to handle like orientation again it, orientation like if someone is using different orientation we can guide them to correct it and and sometimes even if orientation is different we can we still able to handle algorithmically automatically so th this is one another thing is placement if it is in the pocket for example cough detection the cough will be muffled but we, we also did some experiment and it still works because some of the sound are still so clean or so vigorous that we can we can see the clean signal um, after even if we have some variation based on the distance orientation or placement yeah, thank so, you. one question from the participant dr belay hoshan uh, can you can you please um, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I can hear you. Okay, uh, my name is Bela Sen. So um, uh, I'm listening to uh, you from Japan. So basically, uh, my, I have uh, one question to Dr. Mahabur Rahman. Um, so I, I note that I also work with medical and biomedical data analysis. So mm -hmm. I am a bit curious about uh, the procedure of your research not about the technical term. So uh, because you have a very impressive uh, result already published in many uh, outline paper uh, and also journals. And so my question is related to a research procedure. For example, so uh, I also deal with the uh, patient data. So it is very, uh, very, uh, very sophisticated data. So secure, uh, need to be ensured security. So and another thing is that, so we need some collaboration with the medical uh, 
medical doctor or the clinician. So mm -hmm. regarding to that, so uh, how uh, do you uh, prepare ground truth data in industry? Uh, do you uh, uh, does it pro provided by the uh, clinician, or you do it by yourself, or uh, using your staff in your uh, industry? And other thing is that how do you validate or verify your result with the clinicians? Because we are also do, doing uh, this in academia, so I am a bit interested. Uh, uh, about the procedure in industry. Thank you very much for your answer. Okay, thank you very much. So, again, this is a very interesting point that the data that we are collecting, these are health related data, and there is no compromise in terms of security and safety of the data. And this is the part of IRB. You, you may be familiar with uh, in institutional review board, any human subject studies go through several, several. A thorough procedure. One thing is the institutional review board, and also uh, in 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 our Samsung, we have legal team. They are very very meticulous about each and every point about the security and and privacy of the user or the data that we collect. So for clinician data uh, for patient data collection, we collaborate with with external partner. For example, I mentioned Harvard Medical School. We have pulmonologist. They are treating the patient. And then we have collaboration, academic collaboration, of industry and academia or hospital collaboration. From there, we collect the data. We collect data not only from the phone, but also from hospital grade devices. As I showed, this is the spirometer, portable spirometer, it's still not hospital grade. But for ground truth, we need as good as possible uh, for, for our analysis or modeling. That's why we use hospital grade data from uh, from those uh, collaboration. And then uh, during annotation, we do annotation in several ways. One annotation is sometimes for large data, big data annotation, we cannot ask our clinician to, to annotate every, every uh, data point because this is so, um, so time consuming and, and monotonous. So it's not the best use of the best mind in the world. That's why we sometimes do the annotation uh, from, from crowdsourcing and then we verify them with with uh, with our clinician because without clinician verification we cannot use them as a ground truth because this is clinical data and when it is coming the data is coming directly from hospital grade device for example PFT lab uh, so FEV1 FBC ratio coming directly from the hospital device then we can use them as a ground truth so there is no annotation needed additional but this is how we we are going back and forth iterating several times to generate the high quality data that we can rely on. Otherwise, random data, maybe I can collect from myself and then write something, some code, some, um, uh, some model. It may not generalize, may not make sense to anyone, especially clinicians are very, very meticulous about what we do, what we develop our model, because this is about life of some, someone, or maybe the, the health, is, there is no compromise on quality. Does it answer your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. So uh, thank you very much. So uh, my another question is about the uh, clinical collaboration is that so uh, do you how do you often um, uh, have a um, research meeting with the clinician? So yeah, I am a bit in, uh, curious about this. <laughs> no, but the thing is those collaboration sometimes is confidential, right? So I cannot explain every detail. Sorry about that, uh, but yeah, I mean, as as needed, most of the time, or regular plus as needed uh, meeting. Uh, okay, thank you very much. So uh, my 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 another question is to Mrs. Rahman. So uh, thank you for your great presentation and a good uh, research assignment. So and also for this uh, the, uh, your doctoral degree, congratulations. So uh, my first question is uh, related to stress detection using ECG signal. So I also work with the biomedical signal analysis. So I am a bit curious about um, uh, about this issue. So uh, as we know that, so uh, RR interval measurement or uh, uh, so uh, heart rate variability AHRV uh, um, uh, index is very uh, well established and. Uh, um, a popular method for stress detection. So maybe so you skip these kind of things or uh, use uh, another techniques uh, for stress measurement. So uh, could you um, could you uh, uh, tell me? So did you uh, verify your method using this kind of index or so how did you measure uh, 
uh, stress uh, in terms of technical uh, technical methods. Uh, so and yeah, yeah. Thank you for the question. So I just gave an overview on how to detect stress. So I didn't go into the detail. So we have used the ECG, and you say that HRV is a good index as for a stress measurement. And for that, we have used several R to R interval features, like we aggregate over a minute window. So for that, we mean, median, and percentile, several percentile values for that one minute of R to R interval so that we can know whether this one minute of data is corresponding to stress or not. And most of the literature shows that HRV is, uh, shows, is proportional to the stress variation. And here we have shown that other than, though HRV is a good measure for the stress, but we have shown that with other features like the mean, median, and other things, they give a robust measure of stress and as a ground truth, we collected data from our participant and we verified it with those uh, data set that when they say they, they are stressed, so we got a good correlation in both lab and field. So that's why we have, we have the stress model is uh, developed and published in a top tier venue. And I'm writing the title of the paper that is C stress. So if we need to learn more about this stress, uh, how we detect it, and you can go over the paper for more technical details. So yes, we have used both ECG and respiration. And from the respiration, we also use some inhalation duration, exhalation duration, and the ratio of inhalation to exhalation. What is the stretch of a breathing signal? So we augment this breathing signal feature with those ECG signal feature or r to interval to have a robust measurement of stress in lab and we verified it with the field data. Yeah. Well, Dr. Romana, we are all talking about breathing. I guess you two should have some sort of breathing time. You have so nice presentations. There are a lot of questions coming, coming, coming. So let me give you a few seconds of breathing because in the meantime, we have got a comment from Professor Said, sir. Uh, I'm just reading his comment. Hello, excuse me, may, may, I, may I raise one more question to Mrs. Romana? Uh, I oh, uh, Dr. Alim, I mean, we have uh, one question from uh, Tahmina Zabin, Dr. Tahmina. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. We have no yeah. time, actually, two hours almost. So, okay, uh, okay. So, uh, Dr. Bellet, you okay, can ask uh, questions later. Uh, I mean, after this, we can discuss more. And I can connect uh, her. Oh, thank, with you, you. thank you. Yeah, sure. thank so you. Let me read out the comment first. Yeah. yeah. Comment is uh, usually in DL domain to counter class imbalance. We use data augment, augmentation using noise, but more recent works focus on using generative models like GAN, that is generative adversarial networks, uh, or variational autoencoders to model the data distribution, which can create artificial data. So I think this should be very helpful for a uh, lot of us because that issue has just been discussed, how to handle the in imbalance of data. So. There, there are some other questions. For example, if, if I'm not wrong, Dr. Uh, Tahmin Jebin, uh, she is from UK. And uh, interestingly, participants from more than nine countries, they are over here. That's great. So the question is, <clears throat> do you have custom apps written for this data collection? Yeah, I can take both, both questions. So first of all, uh, thank you for the questions. And uh, about the question about the DL, uh, DL um, generative adversarial network and um, augment data augmentation. Yes, we already are using those, those techniques and sometimes it may be meaningful to generate data when it does not involve uh, maybe health data. Some, most of the time health data, we need to be very careful how we generate the data. And this is mostly useful and we, we have used it for obfuscation because I, uh, one of the question, earlier question was on um, so noise, right? So noise can be in many, many different kinds of noise. We can generate those noise by ourselves using maybe GAN network or maybe uh, some, some other ways to generate the noise. But it, it is, those noise are not directly connected with someone's health condition. So it makes sense, but I cannot generate someone's heart rate. Um, I mean, there can be some ways, but I, 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 we should be very cautious about generate, augmenting data, health related data. Uh, but this is in general very useful uh, in terms of audio analysis, image analysis. Yes, um, we, we have already 
use some of the techniques. And thank you for suggesting that. Maybe we can think how we can use those techniques for health data too. Does it make sense? That can be another big research question. Going to the other second question, do, we, do you have custom apps written for this data collection? Yes, I think this is really important because when I have a research question, the data that I need may not be captured by any existing app. So we, we develop our own app. And one good thing about the Samsung devices like watch or, or the phone, those sensor, raw sensor capabilities uh, can, be, can be captured using existing open API. For example, PPG data, heart rate data, uh, accelerometer data, motion sensor data, a phone and watch, those can be captured using, using very high frequency sampling rate uh, using, using those API. And then anyone can build their app based on their hypothesis, what data they, they want to collect, and they can, they can build their own app to cater their need. Thank you. Okay, great. So just one last question that should be from uh, Professor Ahad. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is about uh, uh, both of you, especially for Dr. Mahbub that, uh, for example, give us two or three research uh, areas where we can do research in Bangladesh uh, related to this kind of things and uh, how to proceed. Uh, so uh, people are working on sensor-based human activity recognition or nuts in care mm -hmm. data cooking challenge, different kinds of things. My, I mean, good number of students are working in Bangladesh. Uh, they are participating in global competitions as well. But um, your, uh, I mean, presentations, both of your presentations are very much interesting uh, and they have lots of scopes. So give us some a realistic two or three areas where we can explore, our students can explore and we teacher can help, something like that, so that we can initiate some uh, new projects or works uh, based on the future perspectives. Thank you. Okay, good questions. Do you want to take it first? Okay, so yeah, there are a lot of open questions, as I mentioned if, and throughout my presentation, there are a lot of open questions that can be easily, uh, or that can be picked by anyone in the in the audience uh, using using our sensor uh, capabilities that i said there are open api to collect data using low cost android phone or maybe low cost uh, low cost uh, wristband to collect ppg data or to collect uh, audio imu and then come up with their own own idea for example how we can uh, may, mitigate the privacy right so as as i said one thing is uh, speech obfuscation inside the audio data. There can be many other ways to handle the same thing. And for that, you need to collect the audio data. And microphone data, I, I, I would say even there are a lot of existing applications that can enable the microphone data collection. So someone can collect, their, uh, collect the data using the smartphone or smartwatch and then see how they can, they can handle uh, the privacy. This, is, this can be open research question, right? So anyone can, can tackle this. Or, or if we simulate the data, as, I, as, uh, as one, one of our audience mentioned, uh, like GAN and other, other approaches, which one is more suitable for which research domain? Is it more suitable for health-related data augmentation or only image? So those are open questions. So I feel anyone can handle or tackle those. Sometimes, I would say for, for, from Bangladesh perspective or low resource on a stand point of view, there are a lot of data available online, publicly available online using, um, that can be used by anyone by doing, going through some kind of IRB, which can be very uh, low effort task. For, I'm aware of one data set, which is called student life data set on collecting. Uh, it is a big data, I, I would say. It's a really comprehensive data set that is publicly available to monitor depression of college students. And it has accelerometer data, it has audio data, uh, audio conversation data, and many other data. So I would encourage to ex uh, explore those data sources and then see what are the research questions they already have addressed and new uh, you can come up with new, new questions from the perspective of your own problem or own area of interest. So this is how I would, I would suggest because data collection is a huge task. It involves a lot of, lot of work 
in terms of writing IRB, this is, uh, study design, data collection, uh, um, recruiting participants, a lot of activities are, are there. So if we can, if we can utilize the public data set, then it will be, it will be, I think, it's quicker and easier, especially from Bangladesh. Okay, so actually, I promised to have that question as the last question, but one more student actually, uh, Maisha Islam Tabuti, she, sh she sh shared another question, so I am allowing that. The question is, uh, we have used machine or deep learning techniques to train data. Which models have been used to train those stressful data and in general, which factors are important to select a model to train data? I guess this is for Dr. Romana. Thank you for the question. I think it, this is a very crucial question, like model selection. So there are uh, things that we need to consider first. So first one is the data set, whether it is a real life data or it is a synthetic data or whether it is collected in the lab. So if we really want to develop a model that is a field or that we can deploy in the real life, so we need to have some good data set. So well, real life good data set that I mentioned that oh, how we can collect the data using visualization system in our case. And the first one is the data collection. Second one is what is the research question? So if it is just a stress, stress detection, then we, if we have data and we have the research question, then we need to define what, feature, what uh, bias signals we are going to use whether it is ECG or whether it is respiration signal or whether it is from the uh, usage of our well, several mobile apps from where we can uh, detect the stress. And after that, when we have the data, we need the label. And finally, we need some model. And for the model, we normally uh, use some basic models like uh, logis we start with the logistic regression or SVM and try to see what is the performance of the model. If those basic models performs good, then we stick with it. And then we try several complex models. Like we can use like a sequential data modeling, like HMM or CRF, conditional random field, to better understand the data and extract more information from the data. And I think the sequential data learning models like conditional random field, it uses information from previous uh, minutes or the next minute. So that can be a good model to deploy. And also the deep learning. Deep learning model is doing really good. But the thing is we need a lot of lots of data set to train a good deep learning model. If we what we have normally data set the data that we have it's not that big because it's hard to collect real life stress data. So what we do, we use the basic models because the basic models like logistic regression, random forest or support vector machine because of the size of the data set. And if those models perform well, I think we can stick with those set, uh, models. And if we have more data, like really huge data that can support deep learning, that and it, and in that case, we can use the deep learning model. Okay, great. So. I guess the questions should come on, on and on. I also have some more questions, but I think it is almost a couple of hours. And if we continue in this way, there should be another couple of hours ahead. So let's wrap this up. Thank you very much for the two speakers, Dr. Mahabub and Dr. Rumana for the very lively, very engaging, very vibrant speeches and all the engagement during the QA session. So you are working for the humanity. Thanks for that. So, Thank you very much. Thank you very much for arranging and also all the audience for, for their time and great, attention. Great. So Thank you. Thanks to the audiences. And now I am going to wrap up from my side and I am handing over to Professor Ahad sir, sir, please. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor ABM uh, Alim al-Islam, Alim al-Islam, uh, uh, Professor of CSC, Buit, uh, for giving us time to chair this session. And luckily, uh, uh, Alim and... Uh, Mahabub are classmates. So that is wonderful. And another thing is that as some of you have noticed that uh, from the video that Dr. Mahabub and Dr. Rumana are in the same room, uh, but we didn't see uh, their cute daughter yet. Maybe she's sleeping. <laughs> so I, I have been expecting anyway. So 
I thank uh, all of you, uh, especially both the speakers, and uh, that's so wonderful. I have learned a lot. I have many questions, so but I request you to give us, uh, especially give me more time so that we can discuss further to generate some uh, research questions and research ideas so that uh, we can share with our uh, peers in Bangladesh uh, because this is possible because of less amount of data compared to image or video domain. And there are lots of researchers. I mean, I know more than 100 uh, students and teachers who are working on related to this topic. So uh, we can, uh, I mean, assist many of them and encourage them uh, to uh, do some quality works. With that, uh, I thank especially to Mainul. And Mainul, uh, uh, are you here? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the Dr. Mainul, please. Thank you so much. Okay, so I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mahbubur Rahman and Dr. Romana Bari for this wonderful presentation. And thank you so much to the audience. I think some of the audience have been there for the last two hours. So thanks to them as well. And special thanks to Professor ABM Alim Al Islam for chairing this session. And thank you, everyone. I hope uh, we can have more like this in future. Thank you. Just one last thing that I mean, it's amazing that we have participants uh, in Facebook and here from more than nine countries. Um, I just mentioned, and and uh, this is the in this presentation, I noticed that uh, remarkably a very good number of PhDs and full professors or associate professors or something like that who attended, uh, which is very good. So uh, it uh, means that there are lots of researchers who are eager uh, to work on this topic. So uh, with that, uh, so we... One thing, one thing I would like to add is, uh, I'd like to thank the IEEE student branch of Dhaka University and the women in engineering. They have been working behind the scene to record this event and also do live streaming in Facebook. So special thanks to them for their support. Okay. So I think we can wrap this up. Okay. Yes, thank you very much and wish you good luck. And uh, uh, Dr. Ahad, we can talk offline if you have. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Stay safe. Yeah.